Welcome to this Freedom Series. And we're delighted that you are here. I want to talk tonight about our circle of freedom. Can you say my circle of freedom? And what it will reveal to us tonight is that freedom comes when we submit to true authority. In James 4 and verse 7, the Apostle James writes and he says, Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. For me, deliverance, spiritual warfare, whatever we want to call it, is a very simple thing. The first question I want to answer is, who do I submit to? You see, we've got some government servants in our, in our church, some civil servants. We've got some friends that work at the correctional facility on the police force. And it's about the chain of authority, isn't it? When you know what the chain of authority is, you can exercise authority. It will really be silly for a civilian like me, if I'm not connected to the government, if I don't have a position, to go to the border of Angola and declare war on the, on the government of Angola. They will actually laugh at me. And I think many Christians, and many times of, as Christians, we try and declare a war on the works of the, the devil and on the kingdom of darkness, but we don't understand authority and we don't understand submission. James teaches us here, he says, submit to God. Uh, that's, let's get the basics right. Submit to God. Because when you submit to God's authority, then you have the authority to resist the devil, and he must, he will flee from you. You see. I remember arriving at a, at a church meeting and some, some of the young people were trying to drive out demons out of two satanistic boys. And uh, it was quite an interesting experience. But these two boys, small young boys, but uh, they, they were giving these guys a hard time. And they were starting to get violent. And, and, and they called me and said, please come and you, you need to come and help. And when I arrived on the scene, I said, well, let's just calm down. I asked them, do you believe in Jesus? And with some resistance from, from whatever demonic oppression they were under, they said, yes. I said, are you willing to submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus? They said, yes, we lead them to Jesus. And we were able to drive out the demons without a show. Without a show. It's about authority, right? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The measure of my freedom is determined by two factors. Number one, the kind of authority I submit to. And number two, the extent to which I submit to it. Think with me. The, the, the kind of freedom, the measure of freedom I experience is what authority do I submit to? Now, when you and I submit to God's authority, His authority is 100% pure. God has no vested interest in us except to have the best for us, except to, have, uh, to see us fulfilling the design that He has for us. And so whenever we submit to His authority, there's absolute freedom. John Bevere, one of the greatest teachers of our time, authors, makes this statement. He says, there's freedom in submission, but bondage in rebellion. As long as Adam and Eve submitted to God in the Garden of Eden, they had complete freedom. They could eat from any of the trees in the garden and there was wonderful fruit in the garden. They had absolute freedom. They had so much freedom, Joey, that they could walk around naked and not even feel ashamed about it. That's freedom. I, mean, I didn't want to take my shirt off when I'm swimming. <laughs> but they had freedom. And the moment they rebelled against God, they came into bondage and so did all of mankind. So when we submit to God, we find freedom. Now, submission to human authority is where the trick comes in. Because human authority was, was given delegated authority on earth to represent God. Now, how many of you know that human authority sometimes mess up? Oftentimes mess up, right? We don't always accurately represent the authority of God. As human authority, sometimes one would have a vested interest in a person. You would give your child an instruction that might not be for his actual good at some points. And so we learn how to operate in authority by submitting to God's authority, number one. Okay. The more godly the authority becomes that we submit to, the more free we will be. Now, now listen here, I'm saying the more godly authority becomes. I'm not saying the more Christian authority becomes. Because 
Like me, you probably have seen some Christians in authority that were completely ungodly. Do you know what I'm talking about? When I talk about godly authority, I'm talking about authority that values what God values. Authority that has the same value system than heaven has, the same value system than God has. And sometimes the non-Christians can be more godly in the exercising of authority than some Christians. It's a bit of an indictment on us. But it's important. I'm talking to young, young girls, young ladies who, who are praying for, for a husband for a knight in, in shining armor. I want to encourage you. Don't just look at how he looks, how big his muscles are, how wealthy he is. But look at how he deals with authority. Look at how he submits to authority. Because you, for the rest of your life, if you marry him, you're going to be subject to that authority. And if that authority is not godly, you're going to have a tough time all. Don't just look at that. At the external, look at the authority and how he exercises godly authority or not. I think the same when, you, when you're working in a circuit, certain working environment. Sometimes it's tough and I'm, my heart goes out for those who work in certain areas, maybe perhaps of government there, where there is a lot of corruption perhaps going. And you need to submit to an authority that's sometimes corrupt and it's, it's tough. But know this, that God will be with you to make a difference even in that environment. You know, when you look for a church, it's important that the worship is nice. It's important that the, the preaching of the word is, is great. It's important that there's a great children's church. But even when you, when you look for a church, when you relocate to another town and you have to find a church, look at the authority structures in the church. Because when things go sour in a church, it's when the eldership and the leadership structures is not in place. There's not a godly biblical structure of authority. Does it make sense? Wow. So gaining liberty requires that we submit to godly authority. And I want to just highlight something. That's, that's really the essence of tonight's teaching is I want to talk about our circle of freedom. Now, there's four words I want to write down here. Responsibility, with that comes authority. Okay. Then there's accountability. Can you say authority? And accountability. And then lastly, liberty, which is freedom. Eh? Say liberty. Okay. So the circle of freedom explains that these things work together. I cannot abdicate my responsibility and lose my authority and think I'm going to have great liberty. What happened in the garden? God gave Adam and Eve responsibility to do what? To rule and reign, to govern, to govern the earth, to govern themselves. And then they failed to govern. Adam did not govern. He allowed the serpent to talk to his wife. Okay? And because he not only failed to govern, what did he do when God confronted him? He said, God's not me. It's, it's the wife that you gave me. So in actual fact, he blames Eve and he blames God. Now we like blame shifting, right? We like to point the finger at everybody else. But the moment he abdicated responsibility, he lost authority. And I've, I've thought a lot on that, so I don't want to belabor that point. Okay. When God called them to account, he abdicated responsibility and forfeited his authority, and hence compromised their liberty. Where they walked in the freedom of the garden, in the cool of the day, they could commune with God. Suddenly, they were in bondage. By the, by the sweat of your brow, you will deserve your bread. Everything became burdensome after that. And this is really what happened. When, when we don't live in our responsibility and authority, the circle of freedom becomes smaller. It's simple. You do that with your children. If you give them a certain responsibility in the house and you give them authority, if they can't give an account for that, they don't do their chores, what do you do? You take away some of their liberty, some of their freedom. Their circle of freedom just becomes smaller. And I think as believers, we have given up too much. We have abdicated too much of our responsibility. We have given away too much of our authority. And so the liberty we live in is, is very small oftentimes. We find the same tendency in Israel as they wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. 
Now God brought them into great freedom. Out of Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt, remember? So he brings them into freedom. He supernaturally enlarges their circle of freedom. Wow, we are free. But then they fail to take up their responsibility. And instead of owning their own attitudes and owning their, their own ways, they started blaming their leaders. They're blaming Moses. They're blaming Aaron. And they're blaming God, actually. And so they lose their freedom. And eventually, a whole generation dies in the wilderness as they lose their promised land. Why is that? It's because slaves refuse to own their responsibility. When they are called to give accountability, slaves always want to blame somebody else. They don't want to own up. And I've got this saying, when, when we blame, we remain. But when we own up, we grow up. Maybe that's a good time to turn to your neighbor and poke them a little bit and say, when you blame, you remain in the wilderness. But when you own up, you're going to grow up. You see, the more we own our God-given responsibility, be it as a parent, as a husband, as a wife, as, as a worker, as a business owner, when we own that responsibility, God gives me more authority and He gives me liberty. But they work together. And there's so many examples in, in Scripture. Joseph is a great example. You know, his brothers conspired against him. They sold him off as a slave. They wanted to kill him. He could easily blame them and probably be justified. But Joseph said, I'm not going to blame my brothers. I'm going to own my responsibility. And you know what? God entrusted to him authority. He arrived as a slave in Potiphar's house, and his circle of freedom was so big. He was a slave. He was in change. But because he owned his responsibility, and he gave a good account, what happened? God gave him more authority. Later, he had all authority over all of Potiphar's house, and he had great liberty. See, just expand it. Then there was an unfortunate event where Potter's first wife gave her eyes to, to Joseph and she wanted, she wanted him and he ran away and she lied about him and he landed up in prison. And again, through the doing of other people, his circle of freedom closed down to a prison cell. But again, Joseph did not even blame. He just began to serve and operate in the responsibility that was given to him so quickly and he gave an account that his authority in the prison was expanded. And the Bible says that everything in that prison, the prison keeper delegated to, to Joseph. He ran the prison. And this is what the Bible says. It says, and the prison prosper because of Joseph. You see, that's just the pattern of God's word, you know. When we take our responsibility and we give an account for what God has given us, He expands our authority and He expands our freedom, our liberty. When we own up, we grow up. When we take responsibility, He gives us authority and liberty to do something about our problems. David is a shepherd boy, a young teenage boy, arrives at the front line of the battlefield and he says, I'm going to own up. I'm taking responsibility for this giant. And God says, I'm going to give you the authority to bring about liberty for the entire nation. Wow. Same with Jesus on the cross. He said, Father, I will take responsibility. I will own the sins of mankind. And therefore, Philippians 2 says, God has given him a name that is above every other name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and tongue confess that he is Lord. Why did he give, get supreme authority? Why did he receive superior authority? Authority, because he was willing to take responsibility even for our sins. And so failure to own my responsibility as a parent, as a dad, when I don't speak into my children's life, when I'm not there for them, when I don't fulfill my roles as a father, you know what I'm doing? I'm giving up my authority and something or someone else will become the authority in my children's life. Another voice, be it MTV in the olden days, be it the gaming console, be it YouTube, but something or someone else be, will become the dominating, the governing voice within their life. And then when they're teenagers and we want to correct their behavior and give input into their lives, suddenly we have lost the liberty to speak into their lives. 
because we have abdicated responsibility. And it's, this is not to give a guilt trip, but it's a wake-up call for us as parents to say, what is my God-given responsibility? I want to own up to that. God is faithful. If we've messed up and we confess that, God will give you a way back. Oh, even as a business owner, if I, if I don't fulfill my responsibility to steward the business well, eventually I will leave, lose the authority and the liberty that comes with that. Any position any leadership role, even in the church. Now, what is the law of responsibility? The law of responsibility explains how authority and liberty fl- follows responsibility. Authority and liberty follows responsibility. That's the law of liberty. The law of li- responsibility says, whoever I blame gains power over me. Whoever I blame, I'm giving power over. If I blame, like Adam blamed Eve, he gave power to his wife to rule over him. And I think too many men today resent their wives for this and that and that, and they're actually giving power away. And instead of governing and ruling the household, they're abdicating not only responsibility but authority. Whoever I blame, I give power to. You see, Adam pointed at Eve, and Eve pointed at the serpent, and... The serpent didn't point at anyone. He didn't have a finger to point. Neither had a leg to stand on, right? But Satan was happy to take the blame because he knew if he received the blame, he received the power. He received the authority. You see, people who continually blame their parents for what had happened in the past, and I cannot live a successful life, I cannot fulfill my life purpose because my parents messed up in this way and that way, and yes, maybe they did. We've got the relentless course that takes care of that, the the retreat. But maybe they did. It's not about that. If we continuously blame our parents, we're giving them and whatever they did to us undue power and authority over our lives to control our future, to limit our liberty. Some people blame their bosses all the time, their managers. They're always moaning and complaining about their bosses. And when you do that, you're giving your boss or your manager undue authority to control your circle of freedom. How about blaming the government? Come on. We all do that. We're all guilty as charged. You know, some of us still blaming the old government for what happened 20, 30, 40 years ago. Some of us blaming the new government. You see, when I blame the government for my welfare, for my happiness, I'm giving that government that I'm blaming undue authority and power over my life, over my happiness over my joy. When we blame, we remain. When we own up, we grow up. And so, how do we gain authority and liberty? It's simple. We, we just have to own up. We just have to take responsibility of what God had entrusted to us. So how do we do that? We do it through repentance. And this morning I explained what repentance means. It's, it's not really the word repentance. I have to use it in English because It's our only frame of reference. I wish we could just cut the word repentance and speak of of metanoia. Because that's a real word. Repentance has this penance thing attached to it. That's not anything that God intended. Penance says you you must harm yourself and, and mutilate yourself so that you can prove to God that you're really sorry about what you've done. That's penance. Repentance. But metanoia is the Greek word. Metanoia says, I just change because I hang out with God. I just change because I spend time with Him. I'm in so much in close proximity to Him that I begin to think like He thinks and His opinions become my opinions. Let me just highlight quickly your authority in Jesus Christ because this, remember tonight we're laying a foundation. And so it's important that you and I grasp what is our authority in Jesus Christ. While we want to know what the plans and the schemes are of the devil, we should not be unwise about his his schemes and his plans. We never want to have a greater awareness of the devil than what we have of the presence of God. Come on. For me, spiritual warfare is not as much as being aware of what the devil is trying to do, but it's being aware of what God is already busy doing. And I'm just aligning with that. Amen. Because I know when I'm on his side, I'm on the winning side anyway. Come on. So what is our authority? Just some scriptures. 
The scripture says that we overcome the enemy because greater is he that is on the inside of us than he that is in the world. Last year we had the Overcomer series where we just zeroed in on this verse. There's a scripture that says, For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy all the works of the evil one. You see, when, when I feel that there's works of the evil one taking place in my life or in the, the family or in the marriage or in my finances, all I need to do is let the Son of God be manifest. Because when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, manifests in me, He's going to destroy the works of the evil one. Come on. And you and I carry the living Christ on the inside of us. And oftentimes we just need to let Jesus arise. Let Him break out. Jesus says, I give you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Does Satan have power? Yes. But Jesus says, I give you authority over his power. What's the difference between power and authority? Let me illustrate. If there's a traffic officer and he's wearing his uniform and he's wearing a white glove and he's standing next to the road and there's a 10-ton truck coming at 120 kilometers, Who's got the power and who's got the authority? The truck has got the power. The traffic officer has got the authority. Does Satan have power? Yes. He has power. He's got some real power. We can see it in the lives of people that he harms and damages. But Jesus says, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. What happens if that traffic officer puts his hand out and the truck driver says, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to submit to your authority. And he, with all his power, he violates that authority and undermines it and drives past. What's going to happen? Come on. That traffic officer is going to call in his number plate. And that truck driver is not only going to meet the authority, but also the power of the government of South Africa. If they have to rock up in tanks, they will rock up in tanks to stop that truck. You see, that's what, what happens to us. Jesus is saying, all of heaven's government's authority is vested in you. I give you authority over the power of the evil one. And when you address that, he has to answer to you. If you submit to that authority, you can resist the devil and he must flee from you. Otherwise, he's going to face the whole kingdom of God. Wow. Jesus says this in Luke 10 verse 10. and The context of that is actually so beautiful. He sends out the disciples two by two. And he says, go and heal the sick, pray, preach the gospel, do all of this. And they come back and they're so excited. They say, Jesus, you wouldn't believe what happened. We drove out some demons and we raised the dead and the cripple. And it's amazing, Jesus. And Jesus says, yes, when you were out there, I saw Satan fell like lightning. And then he says something interesting. He says, do not rejoice in the fact that spirits submit to you. But rejoice in the fact that your names are written in heaven. Rena rejoice in the fact that your names are written with my name in heaven. It's really what it means. Come on. That there, there, there where my name and my rank in heaven is recorded, your name is written there by my name. In fact, the transliteration of that scripture says, Rejoice in the fact that your name is intertwined with mine in heaven. Remember that story. And we'll probably get to that later in the week as well, where it's a true account in the book of Acts where Paul and them are driving out demons. And, and then there was these, these Jewish exorcists. They were like the ghost busters, yeah? the Jewish ghost busters, okay? They were Jewish exorcists, and they were driving out demons, but they didn't get it right. So what they started doing is they were saying, we drive out this demon in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Remember that story? Have you ever read that? It's very fascinating. And so what happened is they try and drive out these this demons out of this demoniac and, and instead the, the, the demons so manifest and this guy begins to attack them and he strips them of their clothes and they had to run away wounded and naked. And this is what the demons said. When he said, when they said we drive out this demon in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, this, the demon said this. He said, Jesus we know and Paul we have heard of but who the heck are you? You know what the transliteration of that verse is? Jesus, we have known right from the beginning. 
And Paul, we have come to know that he is of the same league as Jesus. But who the heck are you? Submit to God. Resist the devil. And he must flee from you. Do not rejoice that the devils flee. But rejoice in the fact that your name is intertwined with my name in heaven. That your name is written with my name, alongside my name in heaven. Because when we submit to Him, when we submit to His authority, we can resist the devil and he must flee from us. In Matthew 12, verse 28, it says, But if the Spirit... But if by the Spirit of God I drive out demons, Jesus says, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder the house. Final thought I want to leave with you is that open doors compromises our freedom. We can leave doors open in our life. And in Tuesday night, specifically, we're going to look at what kind of open doors we might have had in our lives Maybe it's open doors that our parents have left in our lives. And so the devil has a legal entrance, not maybe to possess us, but to oppress us. I don't believe that a born-again, spirit-filled believer can be, can be possessed by a devil, but we can be oppressed by a devil. Does it make sense? Because the Spirit of God lives in me. But in the realm of my soul, and we're going to explain that tomorrow night, how that works. In the realm of my soul, a demon can oppress me and harass me. I remember when we lived in Joburg, and uh, we had a guest that was running there, and, and then one morning early, five o'clock, one of our guests, I don't know why he did it, but he opened the, the garage door of his unit, and he was, while he was packing his car, his garage door was open. And uh, I mean, this is not Kimberley, this is Joburg, right? And so three or four robbers came in, they were armed, and they took him hostage in his room and tied him up with cable ties. But their, their whole objective was they wanted to come into the main house. But they couldn't come into our house because we had double security doors that was locked. You see, the devil can only enter if he can find an open door. He can only find legal entrance if there's an open door. And we open doors through the kind of agreements we make. Do you know that the thoughts we think and entertain, the attitudes that we harbor, forms agreements in the spirit? The words we choose to speak is like contracts. Remember in the olden days, we didn't have written contracts. I'm talking way back. Uncle Bob, way back. It was verbal contracts, right? The word is your ear. And if we said, if we shook on what we agreed on, that was a contract, right? In the spirit, that's still a contract. Still a contract. And so sometimes with the words, our actions, our attitudes, we form spiritual contracts, spiritual agreements that opens up doors where the devil can come in and his demons and, and harass us. The good news, however, is that if you hold the authority to open the door, you also hold the power to close the door. You and I can close the door. That's what we're going to do this week. So in the next couple of sessions, that's what we're really going to focus on. You're going to see how the anointing of Jesus Christ has the power to break every demonic bondage and remove every burden that comes with that. It says in Isaiah 4 verse 6, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And so sometimes we get involved in, in a behavior that opens the door to the devil. They're out of ignorance, right? Sometimes we do out of intention. We sin intentionally. Other times we sin unintentionally in ignorance the devil doesn't care if I open the door in ignorance or by intention if there's an open door he's going to come in does it make sense and so this week is a week where we're going to have times of repentance of saying Lord forgive me for opening these doors but I want to close them and give the devil no space we have a tendency to deny some of these things you know, a little bit like the ostrich that puts his head in the sand and say, if I ignore you, then you're not real. But you know, there's these repetitive patterns in our lives, these repetitive areas of defeat in our life. 
which means they're real. It's the effects of our sins, not only our sins, but also the sins of other people. And so we're going to do two things this week. One is we're going to deal with our own sins and we're going to deal with other people's sins. How do we do, deal with our own sins? Through repentance or metanoia, if we would. How do we deal with other people's sins? How they, their sins affect us? Forgiveness. We're going to release the supernatural power of repentance this week. And we're going to release the supernatural power of forgiveness this week. And it's going to set us free of any yoke of oppression or bondage. So I want to encourage you, prepare your heart. On, on Thursday evening, we're going to do an activation called the River of Mercy. Where we're going to place people who, who've harmed us through their deeds in the River of Mercy. On Tuesday night, we're going to have times of repentance and confession. Not only for our own sin, but also for the sins of our fathers if we need to. So that we can cut ourselves loose from any bondage that comes with them. We're going to close those doors. I've learned one thing. There's everybody has something to confess. It can be something small, but everybody's got something to confess. And everybody has someone to forgive. Come on. Always. If you say you have nobody to forgive then we must put you in a glass cage because you're not human. Because if you live in a real world like most of us do, somebody is going to offend you. Somebody is going to disappoint you. Somebody is going to drop you. And you don't need to forgive them. Come on. And if you're saying that you never sin, boy oh boy, then we need to put you in a glass cage just in case you do sin. Everybody has got something to confess. So everybody has someone to forgive. And, and that's what we going to get into. I, I've learned this one thing, and that is that God meets me at the place of honesty. God never encounters me at the place of self-righteousness. God never encounters me at the place where I justify myself, when I talk myself out of a situation. No, no. He encounters me at the place where I say, God, I'm, that's me. I messed up. I made this mistake. And you know what? When I do, this is mercy and grace and freedom that comes. Remember, there's freedom in submission to God's authority. There's bondage in rebellion, but there's freedom in submission. So I wonder tonight, how big is your circle of freedom? You know, when, when my circle of freedom becomes smaller and smaller, my life becomes small. My relationships around me become small. Everything becomes narrow. God didn't call us to live narrow lives. He called us to live big lives. Amen. But maybe we pray one thing. Let's, let's pray this. Can we ask God forgiveness for abdicating responsibility, for blaming? Can we do that? You can just stay in your seat and pray this prayer with me. Say, thank you, Father, for your wisdom and for your authority that liberates me, that your authority doesn't bring me into bondage. But it sets me free. Forgive me, Father, for every way and any way in which I have abdicated my responsibility through blaming others and through complaining. But today I own up so that I can grow up. I want to own my responsibility so that you can increase my authority and increase my circle of freedom. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen.